Hi, my name is Lucille, Frank's mom, and he asked me to tell you about my medical story. I had um, artificial insemination in 1992, and it was successful. It was such a wonderful feeling after tr trying to have children. That was my dream come true. And I found out in April that I was going to be the mother of triplets. So I was so excited. And this, by the way, was in New York. And I saw this construction worker and he was in a hole. And all I saw was his face. And I said to him, by the way, I'm having triplets, I screamed. And he goes, right, lady. So nobody believed me because I'm this little itty bitty thing. So it was so exciting. And I used to work down in Manhattan. And then I found out at 20 weeks, I had to go on bed rest because they were concerned about me not being able to hold the children and also the concern for the safety of the triplets. So my life was all of a sudden turned around from going to be uh, working on Wall Street, working with the uh, executives. I'm laying in bed, bored out of my brain. So here I find out all the daytime game shows I'm not one of those for soap operas. But anyway, the good news is pregnancy is going great. And then all of a sudden I feel uh, something on my leg. And it was itching the heck out of me. So I went to my doctor, the gynecologist, in this case obstetrician. obstetrician and she sends me to a dermatologist. I go see her and they do a test. And they say I have some kind of, which is well-known, pregnancy rash. And I was a little upset about it because they wanted me to take prednisone. And I didn't want to take prednisone. I'm not a, a medicine type of person at all. And with that, they said, well, you're going to have to take it. It's only going to get worse. So I took the prednisone. And the rash didn't subside. It didn't get any worse. But... It was um, very uncomfortable. So with that, on that note, my doctor also says I had a due date in December. They moved the babies up four weeks because they felt at that point it would be too much of a risk for the kids. They may start to lose weight and they were concerned um, with the overall health of myself and the triplets. So on a dreary day, in November, I had a C-section and um, the kids came out beautifully. They was very quick. They said, it's going to be five minutes in between and I was expecting that. So when they said it's a boy, I and I knew in my heart of hearts what they were, but I never told anyone. And I said, yes, it's a boy. And they said, it's a boy. I said, I know that. They go, oh no, no, another boy. And it was so fast and then they said it's a girl and I screamed oh my god I got my family so it was so exciting and then three days later I'm in a hospital well-known hospital in, in New York and I'm not really one to look in the mirror but I was brushing my teeth and I'm saying I look pretty green I said these lights are terrible in this hospital and it was an old hospital, so I attributed to the, uh, the lack of lighting. And then I find out later that day that they, one of the doctors come in and said, well, you need to get a blood transfusion. And by the way, prior to all this, I said to my doctor, listen, I get very heavy menstrual cycles. I am concerned when I have give birth that I should maybe have blood lined up for me because... I'm a heavy bleeder. And she was like, oh, no, no, this is no problem. And so I mentioned this once before this. So needless to say, the doctor comes in that night and says, you have to get a blood transfusion. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm like, yes, you have to. I said, well, I'm not doing it. So this was three days after the birth of the triplets, by the way. And he said, well, they didn't tell me, but they told my family, if I don't do it, I'll have a 50% chance of not seeing the next day. So 
with that in mind, they convinced me to do the blood transfusion. And then when my three brothers told me they loved me, I was like, oh my God, something is really wrong because they never said that in my whole life. So I said, okay, I'll get the blood. I was more worried about getting AIDS from blood and hepatitis type C. So I get the blood and all of a sudden I have a negative reaction. They say I'm building up antibodies to the blood and that is why I wind up on life support. Basically all my organs failed and now I'm intubated and I'm in the hospital and I'm starting to uh, get dialysis. I have renal failure with all this going on and I'm telling one of the renal specialists, I said, listen, my kidneys are coming back because I'm urinating very well and they keep insisting that I get these plasmapheresis treatments. And what I basically have is, um, they call TTP, I, I, HUS, it's a, a blood disorder. And the reason I think I got that is with the C-section, I lost a tremendous amount of blood that nobody really told me about, but my husband saw a pool of blood on the floor. Now I couldn't see anything because I was upright and I couldn't see the floor. But anyway, needless to say, I'm telling these doctors, my kidneys are coming back. No, 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 you need more phoresis, you need more phoresis. So it came to the point that my, then I was having no kidney function whatsoever, urinating very little. But what was happening is the plasmapheresis, I was rejecting, my body was rejecting and my antibodies were building up so strongly that my kidneys basically from whatever happened at the cesarean shut down so i'm still on life support i can't talk i'm writing like crazy on a notepad to the nurses telling them because they wanted to give me other treatments and i kept saying no 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 and then in the interim they're trying to get me off the respirator and this happened at least five or six times and I would tell them, no, I am not ready. And they would again take off the tube and an hour later I would be back on life support. So finally they started listening to me and one of my dear friends, maid of honor, came by and I was very nervous because I was getting another treatment and I was actually off the respirator. I said, oh, stay with me because I'm a little worried Every time this happens, I go into respiratory distress. So I was concerned about getting into respiratory distress. So my best friend is with me. I said, listen, I'm getting this treatment now. Please stay with me because I am concerned. And if I can't talk, I wave my hand. That means you got to get somebody to stop the treatment. So when she's there, sure enough, 20 minutes into the treatment, I feel it. I wave my hand and they come in, they say code blue, and guess what? I'm back on the respirator. So now, it happens again, and I tell them, listen, you have to listen to my, me. When I tell you I'm ready to get off, I'm ready to get off. And in the interim, I'm doing dialysis three days a week, which is a not a, not a good thing. They were probing my neck to get me access many times. I've had body punctures all over my wrist. They, I said, please get a real doctor. They had these people that were experimenting on me, you know, medical students, which are all well and good, but when you have somebody in this condition, they could learn by looking, not by trying. So anyway, I go back on the respirator and in December, they decide to put a fistula in me because they say it's uh, dialysis, it's difficult to do through a port on the neck. So with that I get surgery and they put a fistula in my arm which is going to give me access so that I can have dialysis actually to this arm. And you could see this is where all the puncture wounds were from when I had dialysis. 
So, and then they actually removed the fistula, what was that, a couple of years ago? Yeah, I, I waited uh, almost 15 years to remove the fistula because I was concerned if I had to get um, dialysis again. So they removed that, the actual team that put in the kidneys, which were incredible, by the way, in uh, Westchester. So with that, I'm back on dialysis, and I'm not having, it's not a good thing. I wind up getting steroid psychosis. They were giving me, treating me with prednisone to keep me alive. And they said, well, we have to do this to keep her alive. Well, I never knew what steroid psychosis was. So I'm starting to feel a little off. And while I'm on dialysis, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm getting like hallucinations. And I never did any drugs before or smoked or I don't drink. So this was all new to me, but I was hallucinating as I'm on the machine and it was the scariest thing in my life. So with that, I finally, um, I'm having the dialysis and they uh, get a psychiatrist. And one of them say, well, if she's not dead within five days, we'll be surprised. So that then on another note, before all this, I was in the hospital for a good two months. I uh, get another treatment, plasmapheresis this time, and my father's with me. And I said, Dad, if I do the hand again or I can't talk, you got to stop the treatment. Sure enough, it happens again. So they stop the treatment. I wave my hand. And one of the doctors that comes by and says, oh, by the way, you shouldn't have gotten that because you could have had a heart attack. I said, you don't have to tell me. I felt my body building up with fluids. So before I got on the respirator again, they stopped it. So then I finally, two months in the hospital, I get to the privilege of going home and the privilege of coming down to New York three times a week for dialysis. And I was so weak that my husband used to have to carry me from the car to the hospital because from the car, we didn't have a wheelchair, and I was too proud to be in a wheelchair. So anyway, it was kind of romantic. Here we are, going through the streets, being uh, carried by my husband. So anyway, now I'm on dialysis, and like I said, I was starting to feel a little weird, and I go into full-blown steroid psychosis, which is basically, you lose your mind, and my husband and his sister wanted to check me into a mental hospital. So I go there and I'm looking around and I said, now I know this is medically induced why I'm off, but these other people, I don't know, but they scared the lights out of me. So they're insisting, oh no, you have to stay here for 72 hours. I said, oh no, I don't. So I go into the room and it's literally, it's like a lockdown. You go in the room and you stay there in the bed with three, two other people. You cannot get out. And I'm like, this is not for me. I know I'm not right, but this is not for me. So anyway, they send me home. And that's when the doctor said, oh, if I don't see you, her name in the obituary for five days, it's a miracle. So what they did was they gave me Haldol, which is a medication to offset the side effects of steroid psychosis but it makes you very stiff and rigid and you have no emotion whatsoever. You're like a blank slate. But anyway, I get through it and how I got through it was when you reduce the amount of prednisone in the body, the, the um, side effects are reduced. So when basically when I went down to almost, I think 20 milligrams of prednisone, I was, thank God, back to myself. So it was all good. I'm trying to get stronger. I'm walking. I'm still living at my mother's. My mother, God bless her, raised the triplets with me for the first six months. And um, finally, I go home in April. And I'm still on dialysis, but now I get, because I'm kind of stabilized, they send me to where I lived in the Bronx. So it's a little easier. I don't have to go into the city. I'm able to walk again. My husband doesn't have to. He takes me the first couple of months, but eventually I drive on my own. So it's all good. I say, this is, how do I deal with this? And one doctor said, well, deal with it like it's a part-time job. So I did. 
but it was no picnic. There were many times where I would bleed for hours after the, the treatment, and uh, I actually saw a patient or, a, around maybe 10 feet away from me. He's bleeding out. I'm seeing blood on the floor. And now the dialysis nurses didn't notice. I said, by the way, I think you should check that patient. And he almost died right there. So it was, it was very frightening. And I was always awake because if they gave you too much heparin, which is a blood thinner, you could basically bleed to death. So anyway, I did that for almost five years. And I was on various transplant lists, one in Westchester, one in New York, one in Philadelphia. And I said, how do I know my brothers, I have three brothers, I didn't want them to give me any kidney, although one of them was a perfect match. I just didn't want anybody to suffer. So I get this call in July, but backtracking. In November, I tell my father, I'm so excited, November 7th, and he was not well. He, otherwise, he would have gave me a kidney. I said, Dad, guess what? I am so close on the list. And this was the one in, I don't know which one, they didn't tell you. So he was so happy. He goes, you made my day. You made my life. Then the next morning, he dies. But I know that um, that he knows that I was going to get well. So anyway, the next day. It's all right, Ma. It's all right. It's okay. The next day, I go into dialysis. And I'm, I'm doing okay, but I don't know if he's gone. But I just get this feeling because the night before, I wanted to see him and it was very bad the weather. And I said, I just want to see Dad because he was on oxygen now. But anyway, I didn't get to see him. And I find out that night, 2 o'clock, he's, he's no longer with us. And I was very close to him. I was Daddy's little girl. But anyway, six months later, I'm on dialysis, and now my bones are starting to go, and they said, that's when you have to worry. All of a sudden, I go to dialysis, and I always talk to my father. People think it's nutty, but we had a good relationship. And I look up in the sky, and it was July 24th. I said, Dad, I can't do this anymore. you got to help me. And I see it was a cloudy day, and all of a sudden, the skies part, and I see a blue streak of light. And that was his favorite color. I said, okay, Dad, I know things are going to get better. Sure enough, the next day, July 25th, <clears throat> I get a call. We have a kidney for you. And I was like, I was in shock. I was so happy. I said, you're kidding me. He goes, no, no. What happened was the person before you didn't want it. They were waiting for their fathers. So we have a kidney. But. We don't know if you're a match. I said, okay. So I called my husband and he was frozen. He worked in a courthouse. He couldn't even move. But I was so excited, I'm jumping up and down. I said, we gotta go, we gotta go. So we go and it's in Westchester. So that night they do all this blood work and they tell me, well, we don't know if it's gonna work and it's a match. I said, okay. So I'm up all night. I'm sitting up, I'm jumping around, my husband's sleeping, I'm like, are you kidding me? How could you be sleeping when I was getting this kidney, right? So the next morning I find out it's a good match. So now we go into surgery. It's a seven hour surgery. I had the best team, incredible. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna be off dialysis. This is amazing. So that's a Wednesday. And they say, they pump me up with fluids, about 40 pounds. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm not, you know, I'm urinating my little, little bit, but it's not happening. Nothing's happening. Like, well, sometimes they're sleeping, the kidneys. I said, what does that mean? It takes a little time. Sometimes they don't work right away. So now with this extra 40 pounds of fluid on me, I can't breathe. So Sunday, I said, listen, I don't want to go into respiratory distress. I need dialysis. They're like, no, you don't. I said, no, no, no. I know my body. you got to get somebody today to give me dialysis. So sure enough, they rig it up. They bring the machine up to me, and they do dialysis, and now I can breathe. 
And then a day or two later, I started urinating and just kept urinating and urinating. And thank you, Lord. My, my kidneys are great. And by the way, I received two pediatric kidneys. And that was in 97. And God willing, I still have them. So it's all good. But uh, what I would say in regard to doctors, there are ones that are great. There are ones that are not so great. But what I recommend is go by your body because you know your body best. And if you're not comfortable with the doctor you're with, you should definitely switch doctors. Here I thought I had the greatest doctor. And by the way, she said to me, she was crying when she saw me in my condition and said she wanted to quit her profession. And it is what it is. But I'm on this transplant medication. I've been taking it for over 22 years and thank God I'm doing well. I am what they call immunosuppressed, so I have to watch, I have to be careful with, as far as people that are sick, I can't go near, but I've, my quality of life has so improved. The only um, regret I have is that I wish I was healthy for when I had the triplets and was able to do what I wanted to do with them. But you know, you do the best you can in life and you learn from uh, things that happen to you, although I feel uh, she ruined my life as far as the quality of life. I tried to make the best of it and you thank each day for what you have and you do the best you can. And that's why I was a little tough on the triplets, but it was because I wanted them to be able to deal with ever life comes through. And my only regret is that I didn't show them more love and have the time and the, and the be more loving is what I'm saying. I mean, I always love them, obviously, but be more affectionate and show them. But sometimes there were times where I couldn't even get out of bed. And the other thing I didn't mention was because of, um, I don't know if it's the medications, I was having severe hemorrhaging and uh, I had to have a partial hysterectomy. But thank God, you know, things are good and the other thing I failed to mention though, and, uh, six years ago, because of one of the medications, I had a stroke. And uh, I was also, the ironic thing was I was working in a hospital and I said, I'm having a stroke. Nobody's listening again. And sure enough, I'm in the hospital and I say, give me the medication, I think it's called TTP, that prevents the effects of a stroke. Again, nobody's listening. So I had to go into get brain surgery because uh, I have water on the brain. That's the only surgery I don't remember. And thank God I recovered. I had to learn how to walk again. My speech was a little slurred. What concerned me was I was seeing sideways. My eyes were a little off. But here I am today and pretty much recovered. So I just say to everybody, don't take anything for granted. Be the best that you can be and be strong because if I listened to anybody, I wouldn't be here today. But I knew I wanted to be here to raise those beautiful babies that God gave me. And they'll always be my babies. And I think they have done so tremendously. And they are such incredible people. And that's my motto. Just never give up. And no matter what they tell you, listen to your own body. And you all have a wonderful day and I thank you for listening. Well, I think everyone wants to know how old you are. How old am I? Oh, do, do you really want to know? You can guess, but let me tell you, I look amazing for my age. I am 61. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone that looks that good at 61, let alone a double kidney transplant. And, and the reason she actually ended up having that stroke is because uh, she was so stressed out working at, at this job uh, for the past, um, for, well, you, how long were you working there? I was there? there six months. You were, yeah, you were there yeah. six months. So, you know, after she had all these health issues, you know, that led into financial issues and she had to still work despite be, being in that condition. So, you know, it's really horrible that the, the medical system 
can almost take away everything you have and give you nothing back. I wish I had a memory as good as hers. And even after she she had her stroke, she still remembered uh, like oddly specific things that I, I could that I obviously don't have the brain for. So uh, thank you guys for joining me today and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. Enjoy your week. By the way, I forgot to mention when I was in the hospital in New York, all of a sudden I'm in the room and I didn't realize there was a priest to the left of me. And Cardinal O'Connor comes in the room and now I'm like, oh, please don't tell me these are my last rites. Why is the Cardinal here? So my husband comes to me and he goes, don't worry, Lou. He's only here because the priest next to you is very ill. I was like, okay. So he talks to me and he gives me his blessing. And then I find out that Christmas, in 1992, he dedicated his homily to me and asked everybody to pray for a very young mom that's um, in the hospital, that's uh, struggling and is on life support and has triplets. So between him and all the prayers, that's why I'm here today. But the main thing I didn't mention why I'm here is because my husband, Frank, has been by my side from the day we met. He did not leave the hospital for two months. He slept by my side, either on the chair or on the floor. And unfortunately, the few times he left is when I went back on the respirator. But without his support and love, I wouldn't be here today. And the reason I'm saying this is that besides you know, taking charge and never giving up. When you find somebody that's so dedicated like that and is there for you day and night, you just have to appreciate everything you have and the support system helps with um, everything in life. On that note, you all have a great day and thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to help you. And uh, thank you very much.